From the much more gruesome and politically active inspiration for Robin Hood to the complete diaspora of organized crime, these are the most notorious criminal families in history. First are the Folvilles. Medieval England was a very chaotic place, and numerous criminal and militia groups popped up and began making mischief, to put it lightly. The Folvilles were an impoverished noble family that used their connections and meager wealth to gather a band of soldiers and begin robbing, extorting, and confining people to make their money. Their big claim to fame, though, is the significant amount of vengeance and political action they undertook, hunting down corrupt lords, or often the lords that tried to cut down on the Folvilles' corruption. They sided against the dispensers in the Dispenser Civil War and made a habit of ransoming off nobles and justices. Despite their own wealth, they were often viewed as a Robin Hood-like family, hunting down corrupt nobles and lords. Next is the Italian Mafia. When referring to the Italian Mafia, we're talking specifically about the American Italian Mafia, because in Italy, they don't call it the Italian Mafia. It was by being brought to America that multiple different conflicting Italian groups were brought together under the title of Italian. The Italian mob, like most organized crime, was born out of poverty and racism, as they were not allowed to work the same jobs and given the same opportunities as local Americans. So the Italians banded together, along with the criminals from Italy, and formed the Mafia. The Mafia was insanely powerful, especially during the periods of the Second World War and the Prohibition Era, but they exist and are active to this day. In fact, they were so powerful and influential that the United States secretly enlisted them to help crack down on spies, saboteurs, strikers, and smugglers during the Second World War. This helped them become the most powerful organized crime syndicate in America and led to a decades-long dominance of the American continent. Next is the Gavrielli family. As Jews from around the world were brought to the colonial state of Israel, they brought their own cultures, creeds, and yes, criminals. Moroccan, Russian, Georgian, and Arab Jews all had their own criminal syndicates and all began actively working within and outside Israel. However, perhaps one of the most famous is the Gavrielli family. We don't know for 100% certain that the Gavrielli family are a syndicate, and so for my own legal protection, this is all alleged. But allegedly, Ezra Gavrielli was a powerful crime boss involved in significant racketeering, extortion, trafficking, and much more. His daughter, Inbal Gavrielli, would join the right-wing Likud party, gain a seat in the Knesset, and use her parliamentary immunity to shut down raids on her father's home and investigations into his tax fraud. It's believed the Gavrielli are closely connected or a part of the Abergil organization, a well-known criminal syndicate in Israel. Next is the Georgian Mafia. The Georgian Mafia are, you guessed it, based out of Georgia, with a split between the cities of Tbilisi and Kutaisi. Unlike other ethnic mobs, the Georgian Mafia has no requirement you be a Georgian to join, which has allowed them to spread throughout multiple nations. It began before the Soviet period, and it's likely that Stalin himself gained power through the Georgian Mafia, using that money to fund his rise into the heights of the Soviet Union. Their close ties to the foundation of modern Russia has allowed them to worm their way deeply into most of the Warsaw Pact and all former Soviet states, making them one of the most powerful, influential, and widespread syndicates in global history. Next are the Yakuza. There are a dozen Yakuza syndicates, with Yakuza really just meaning gangster. They originated in the Edo period, which began in the 1600s, and many have existed continuously for the three to four hundred years since. They formed out of the Tekia, the peddlers, and one of the lowest social classes, who began to organize themselves for protection. This then evolved into the highly structured modern Yakuza, where larger families hold influence over smaller families beneath them, much like a medieval fife system. These more powerful families are heavily integrated into Japanese society, being deeply entwined in many legal and illegal industries and companies, the most powerful being the Yamaguchi Gumi. Nintendo, Pride FC, and many other Japanese companies and organizations chose to or had to work closely with the Yakuza, mostly because the Yakuza hold some of the greatest wealth and capital in the entire nation. However, modern efforts to recriminalize the Yakuza and divide them from the public have helped in restricting corruption and collusion. Next is the Sicilian Mafia. Remember when I said we don't call them the Italian Mafia if they're in Italy? That's because every region has their own organized crime, but the most famous and notorious are the Sicilians. Located on the island of Sicily, they've had a hand in extortion, racketeering, smuggling, robbing, loan sharking, and election rigging since the early 1800s. Just for an example, the red dots on this map of Sicily indicate a city or town that has mafia presence in the year 1900. You may notice the almost complete lack of black dots, especially in the west where the island faces a 
away from the Italian peninsula and smugglers can work more freely. They still exist, having survived all the turmoil in Italy in the last 200 years and were a key component in the founding of the Italian Mafia in America. Next is the Triad. The Triad began as a political action club organized with the intent of overthrowing the ruling Qing dynasty. They were not a strict group and so some sided with the Kuomintang, some sided with the capitalists, and some with the communists. But when the Chinese Civil War resolved itself, it soon became clear that organized crime was no longer going to be ignored or used against internal enemies. Mao and later Deng Xiaoping would heavily crack down on the triad, which led to its splitting and fleeing across Southeast Asia. They relocated to Hong Kong, Taiwan, Malaysia, Vietnam, and numerous other Southeast Asian nations and still operate out of them. In the time since, this secret society has moved away from political ambitions and towards outright criminal ones. There are simply so many though that picking a single family is an exercise in picking the cleanest floorboard in a house fire. All of them are pretty bad. Next is the Scarfo Mob. Of all the Mafia families, it is often the Scarfo Mob that are considered the most notorious. This is mostly due to Nicodemo Scarfo, the boss when it all came crumbling down. Nicky was cruel and vindictive, and while other families would be happy with a cunning revenge of undercutting profits or exposing enemies to the police or outmaneuvering the other families, Nicodemo's favorite and most used tactic was horrifying violence. It's no coincidence that the Scarfo family experienced its bloodiest years under Nicodemo's rule. However, after he became suspicious of his favorite hitman, Nicodemo ordered him put down. You don't exactly get to be the main hitman of the mob for years straight without learning to watch your back, and Caramandi ran to the authorities, gaining immunity in return for putting 11 mobsters behind bars under 52 charges. Next are the Coterelles. The Coterelles were sort of the classic medieval brigands and bandits, living in the woods, engaging in highway robbery and political extortion. Because yes, you could become a powerful political figure in 1300s Britain by being a good enough robber and ransomer. But they would become most famous after they captured the man sent to capture them, Richard Willoughby, and then ransomed him off. They lived in Sherwood Forest, had issues with the Sheriff of Nottingham, and eventually shut down their criminal enterprise to become a war band in support of Queen Philippa. Sort of like Robin Hood, but not quite. And lastly are the Lions of Hussein. Based in Syria, the Lions of Hussein were initially an Assad friendly criminal syndicate that engaged in smuggling, ransom, extortion, and theft. However, after the civil war erupted in 2011, the group moved more towards becoming a pro Assad militia, but still maintained many of their criminal ties and made most of their funds through illegal means. However, after their founder's death in 2015, they reorganized and rebranded into the Lions of Hussein, a now explicit paramilitary in support of the Assad regime and Ba'athist party. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. This cult with the catchiest name was founded in Uganda by four ex-Roman Catholic priests, two ex-nuns, and one former sex worker, and it was initially said to really emphasize the Ten Commandments. Apparently, these leaders thought that the Roman Catholic Church had really just abandoned the Ten Commandments, and they wanted to bring back some rules. They couldn't just focus on these rules, however, they also had to have some sort of doomsday prophecy as well, like all good cults do. They claimed that the apocalypse would come on December 31st, 1999, and in anticipation of this, a bunch of the members sold all of their possessions, so of course, they were pretty irritated when the world, in fact, did not end. The leaders scrambled and instead altered their predictions, saying that the Virgin Mary would instead come on March 17th, 2000, and that she would bring them all to heaven. The followers continued to believe this, and on March 16th, they had a huge feast. The following day, on March 17th, police arrived to where the cult resided and found that an explosion and fire killed hundreds of members of the group. At first, they thought this could have been a voluntary event, but soon they saw the signs that pointed to this being a mass killing. The leaders likely took the lives of the followers because they could not pay them back, and they also knew that their quote unquote prophecies were false. At first, it was thought that the leaders were among those whose bodies were found, but that isn't quite the case. No one is exactly sure if they ended up losing their lives or if they instead fled the country, which many believe to be the case. At this point, there is still a warrant out for their arrest, so while the authorities have never officially confirmed that they are on the run, it truly is the most likely scenario. In our number nine spot today, we have Om Shinrikyo. This cult was founded by a man named Shoko Asahara, and he claimed to be the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva. He said that he was destined to lead his followers to salvation once the apocalypse came, but then once he lured in followers, he claimed he could also teach them to levitate and develop telepathic abilities. Apparently, those who were the most skeptical, he allowed them to drink his bath water. Not really seeing the connection on that one, to be totally 
totally honest, but those are just the facts. The cult continued to grow and drew in influential and wealthy people, and this is where things really took a turn for the worst. This group went on to attack Tokyo in 1994, which took the lives of seven people. Then, in 1995, they released gas into the Tokyo underground, which led to 12 deaths, 50 injured people, and more than 5,000 people with temporary vision problems. In the end, Asahara and 11 of his disciples ended up being arrested and charged for these crimes, and after standing trial, they were all sentenced to death in 2004. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Narco Satanists. Founded by a man named Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo, he was at one point a drug dealer and also the leader of a horrifying cult that was nicknamed the Narco Satanists by the media. Adolfo's followers believed that he had magical abilities, but in the worst way possible. He required his followers to kidnap young men, who Adolfo would practice horrible, sadistic rituals on, and ultimately take their lives in order to replenish this magic that didn't exist. It's an absolutely horrific story, and this carried on for years until the disappearance of Mark Kilroy. Mark was a Texas college student who was in Mexico for some fun over spring break in 1989, but sadly, during this trip, he was taken by the cult's followers. Mark's friends quickly noticed his disappearance and began searching for him, and this led to a border crossing manhunt, and authorities quickly revealed what had been going on, but Adolfo had already fled. He and four of his followers fled to Mexico City, and this is how he was finally caught. Police were called to the apartment they were staying at as a result of a totally unrelated dispute, but because Adolfo knew that they were looking for him, he just assumed that they were there for him, and he opened fire with a machine gun. Not wanting to go to prison, he then handed the weapon over to one of his followers and asked him to open fire on himself, and by the time the police were able to reach the apartment, he was already dead. In the end, 14 cult members were charged for their crimes relating to everything that went on. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Children of God. Karen Zerbe is the leader of the cult now known as the Family of Love, but is much better known by its former name, the Children of God. In 1969, Karen joined a group called Teens for Christ, and ended up becoming the personal secretary to David Berg, who is one of the founders of the group. Eventually, David would divorce his wife in order to marry Karen. Karen had a son named Ricky, and his childhood was made into a book which was used to show other members of the cult how they should raise their children, but the book included some pretty horrific and disturbing content. At first, Karen wasn't around or extremely active in the cult, but she began to insert herself more and more, and began making rules and enforcing discipline. Once David began to get sick in 1988, Karen took over the leadership position that she had been groomed for. After David passed away, she married another leader from the cult, and all the while, Karen was extremely elusive, so much so that some of the followers didn't even know what she looked like. This cult has actually seen a few celebrities over the years. Jeremy Spencer, who is one of the founding members of Fleetwood Mac, is a member of this cult. Joaquin Phoenix and his siblings were unfortunately subject to this terrible cult when they were growing up, but they all chose to leave later in life and as adults have spoken out about it. Unfortunately, Karen is still active as the cult's leader, even though she most definitely should be in prison, and she still remains in hiding, living off of what money she could collect from followers. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Rajneesh movement. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh first became known in the 1960s as he traveled through India speaking out against socialism as well as aspects of mainstream religion. While speaking out about these things, he also advocated for a more open attitude when it came to human sexuality, and it's this stance that quickly earned him the nickname The Sex Guru. By the 1980s, he had taken his teachings to the United States where he opened a facility known as Rajneesh Param in Wasco County, Oregon, but this quickly upset the locals in the area. Not only were there legal battles surrounding his construction, but there were also crimes being committed by the followers of the Rajneesh movement. And we're talking about really serious crimes. There was a mass food poisoning attack with the Salmonella bacteria, which marked the first known bioterrorism attack in the history of the United States. And if this wasn't bad enough, there was also the attempted assassination of United States Attorney Charles H. Turner. Rajneesh didn't take any responsibility for these crimes and instead blamed his personal secretary and her supporters, but despite this denial, he still found himself deported, after which he returned to India. Here he continued to run the Poon Ashram until his death in 1990. Honestly, the story is absolutely bonkers, the crimes are massive, and the entire thing is just very bizarre. Here we go again with the Brethren 
second at number five. If you watch part one of our bizarre cults, you may think I'm revisiting the same cult. Don't worry, I'm not lazy, it's just that cult leaders aren't creative with their names. This brethren cult was founded by the late Jim Roberts, a preacher's son. He had practiced sermon by 15 and later served in the Marines. This combination of strict religion and disciplinary Marine Corps made for a hardened man with some unique ideology. In Chicago, his religious philosophy paired with leadership skills, charisma, and an air of authority allowed him to gain a small group of congregants by visiting college campuses and public areas. He had about 100 followers under a titan of Hold at the time he ordered everybody to drop out of society nomad style in 1971. He had explained the decision in order to secure a place in heaven, people had to begin purifying themselves, according to the passages of the Bible. Brethren must forsake their families and friends and all material goods. You sew your own clothing and you eat from the dumpster. And of course, all money goes to the leader. Laughing and dancing are a huge no-no, as are children playing and anyone accessing medicine or medical care. Naturally, the cult has been accused of negligence for allowing its members to suffer or even die from perfectly curable illnesses. The only acceptable transport to them is bikes, buses, and hitchhiking to get around. Men wear their hair short and have long beards, and women wear long tunic dresses. Women, of course, are subservient to men, and everyone was subservient to robbers while he was still alive. In 2015, that changed as Robert passed from cancer left undiagnosed from his hatred of medicine. But most converts didn't change anything and remained nomadic. Many are still out there. Thanks to the coordinated efforts by parents of cult followers who created the Roberts Group Parent Network, several members have managed to be deprogrammed and returned home. Ikanakar, a fun word that I'm probably pronouncing wrong, is number four. Ikanakar and all its frivolousness was made possible by founder Paul Twitchell in 1965. It's a new age religion group and like many other new age religion groups, it was really just code for a jumble of mysticism and eastern philosophy mixed with yoga, meditation, tarot cards, and made up iconography. Believing all members have ancient roots going back 10,000 years, they were to be given a new name and learn the secretive language of the Ikanars. All of it done in the name of the group's meditation ritual where one chant, ha! and separates their soul from their body. Dreams are regarded as important teaching tools and members often keep journals to facilitate studies. Ekinar teaches that spiritual liberation in one's lifetime is available to all, that it is possible to achieve self-realization. This group started in Minnesota, Canada and it's now spread throughout the country and it's made its way to others such as Europe and Asia, but it's primarily practiced here in North America. Since Twitchell's passing, this group has had several successors and remains popular today. Despite being a registered nonprofit, the group sells its founders materials for a hefty profit and there are allegations that virtually all of the books are plagiarized. Come on, you know by now cults love fraud. Happy Science could have you looking sad in number three. Far right nationalism meets new age spiritualism in the Japanese Happy Science cult. Founded by Rahio Okawa in 1986, he had been a cult member himself in the God Light Association. Okawa decides to dip and start his own cult of personality when he realized that being a cult leader could prove to be a lot more profitable than being an anonymous corporate employee and a cult follower. Okawa pitches in his sermons that he is a human incarnation of of a supreme being called El Cantare, who combines Christ and Buddha and Muhammad and every other prophetic deity to create a nine dimensional heaven with him at the head and of course can communicate with the celestial. He predicts that some of these celestials might visit us one day bearing the apocalypse. He's also convinced that there's a space alliance that forbids any kind of insta-teller attacks or war between planets. Apparently some representatives could already be here living among us, so remember that the next time you start trash talking the aliens. Here's where the strangeness picks up a notch, he also created a massively complex mythology of new age nonsense while simultaneously founding an extremist political wing called the Happiness Realization Party. His party advocates the vicious Japanese nationalism devoted to denying historical cruelties, advocating for conflict with China and North Korea, and to rebuild Japan's infrastructure. The group claims to have 12 million members around the world, has multimedia arm, and enjoys a tax exempt status in the USA as a church. Let's get biblical biblical! Number 2, the 12 tribes. So sorry for how cringy that was. The 12 tribes take holistic and traditional practices to exploit under the guise of new age hippiedom. The Christian fundamentalist cult was born in 1970s led by Albert Eugene Spriggs and his wife Marsha in Tennessee. They advertise their nature communes and 70 themes diners and cafes while it's behind closed doors, their practices are far less than free love. There is a belief that slavery was a marvelous opportunity for black people and the support of conversion camps for the LGBTA who they think the world should be rid of. The 12 tribes tries to keep its 
extremist teachings from outsiders and even some of their inside members. But former members and experts on fringe religious movements who have helped followers escape paint a pretty horrific picture of life in the group. Black and LGBTA members especially suffer, as once indoctrination is over, members change tune and become aggressive towards them. Their followers sacrifice their earthy possessions to live in any of the many communes and follow the teachings of the modern day apostle with no deviation lest they risk being ostracized by the cult and damned to an apocalyptic lake of fire. Members must work for free in the commune stores and cafes. Their access to internet, secular books, movies, everything, worldly influences of any kind are extremely restricted. In its 50 years running, 12 tribes distinguish itself from other tribes with legal businesses, operations such as food services, construction, soap making, woodworking, farming, solar energy, and even an Alaskan fishing operation. By members living communally, sharing money and resources, and all businesses staffed by followers who work without pay, ex-members told the Denver Post this is how the cult perfectly constructed to leave you with nothing should you choose to leave. This next cult is one of unbelievable brutality, it's the Narco Santicos at number one. Okay, so that's a word and a half, but it essentially means the satanic doobie dealers led by Adolfo de Jesus Costanzo. Its members were traffickers and deeply disturbed people. Having studied Palo Meombe from a young age, Adolfo took fascination with the concept of remains having religious purposes and affiliations. This fascination grew, and while Paolo isn't inherently evil and can be used for great good, Adolfo was also exposed to his mother's criminal behavior and criminal consorts as a child, as well as rampant poverty, which were huge influences on his future life of crime. I'm going to keep this vague because the victims deserve to be acknowledged more than the crime. After moving back to Mexico as a teen, Adolfo made a group of friends who indulged his radical and bizarre opinions about the benefits of animal and even human sacrifice in the name of deities. They began to run a profitable business casting spells to bring good luck using Adolfo's Palo background and some made up mojo, involving expensive ritual sacrifices of chickens, goats, snakes, zebras, and lion cubs. Many gangs and high ranking politicians visited the group on their ranch property for these spells. It's here the group indulged in the use of heavy substances and the religious factor was metamorphosized into dark magic intensely. Believing the magic he took from Palo Meombe may be the success of their cartel and the spell business, Adolfo realized that if the dead bones in his Naganga altar worked this well, how well would live ones? Tragically, this realization resulted in the sacrifice of over 20 people, which most had incredibly inhumane ends. The cycle breaks, however, with Mark Kilroy, an American who had been abducted and sadly perished by the group's hand. American authorities put pressure on Mexico and forced their police to find out that a cult leader had been under their noses all along. Adolfo refused to go to prison and went down in a literal blaze of glory, never facing punishments for his crime. 14 other members were arrested and charged, and American authorities still wait for the release of three of these members from life sentences in Mexico for their turn to be prosecuted in the USA. In at number 10 is the Brethren, and it's way less cooler than it sounds. Living an almost Amish way of life, this pilgrim-esque cult is actually led currently by one of Forbes' richest men alive, who lives in a $5 million mansion while his followers aren't even allowed to travel outside of their communities. They have small sites around the world and follow some extreme expectations such as men must work at their exclusive businesses, women stay at home, brethren are not permitted to eat at non-brethren restaurants, stay in hotels, or even live in apartment buildings in a non-member neighborhood. They can't have a swimming pool or use a computer unless it was created and approved for brethren use by a brethren company. The internet is a pipeline to filth, so brethren businesses provide cell phones and computers with a software called WordX that permits only word processing, spreadsheets, accounting programs, and email, but no internet. Women are only to dress from neck to wrist and neck to ankle coverage styles and have a ribbon or scarf in their overtly long hair. Men need to be clean shaven and dress in business casual. Brethren children are to live at home with their parents until the day that they are married. Typically the women get married young because their purpose is to be a dutiful wife and produce lots of children. The brethren genuinely believe that those on the outside of the cult, especially those who left, are evil and living life wrong. Getting kicked out or withdrawn from in this community keeps members in check as losing this lifestyle means being condemned to hell to them. It can be argued between their Messiah being a man of God figure that changes from one billionaire to another every so often, and their exclusive, strict, and elitist premises is that these qualities seem to be an antithesis of what religious movements are supposed to be. But I guess that's up to their eccentric billionaire god. In at number 9 is Crazy for Coconuts. It's a little confusing, but here goes. This German nudist dude, August Engelhard, was so devoted to the consumption of coconuts that he started a cult about them. Loving nothing more than chafing sand and a good sunbird, Engelhart loved sunlight and the tropics. So he started a group of like-minded individuals in Papua New Guinea. While the others were a little more normal at first, Engelhart went hard and only consumed coconuts from day one. He was convinced that the sun was the 
source of all life and the coconut because it grew on top of palm trees closer to the sun than any other food was clearly the best food in the world. He used his big fat inheritance to publish journals about his coconut beliefs in order to develop what he called the order of the sun, wherein members would worship the sun with him. It worked, mostly because it was his money that was shipping people out there. Free relocation to the tropics, eat fruit and dance nude under the sun. Come on, even I'd pack up, let's be real. Even at its peak, the cult never hit 100 members because they had a bad habit of, well, not surviving, only eating coconuts. There were no doctors, and this is an island known for venomous animals and potential illnesses that can be hard to treat. Accidents were also an issue as many of these people had no idea how to navigate island living and were also physically weakened from, you guess it, only eating coconuts. Even Engelhardt was eventually wasting away from coconut exclusive dieting. He couldn't walk, was severely malnourished, afflicted with ulcers, he weighed under 100 pounds and was having seizures, all thanks to a diet of non-stop coconut and generally poor living conditions. Number 8 is one I struggle not to laugh about, it's the Prince Philip movement. Prince Philip had many titles and honors being a British royal, but did you know in a remote South Pacific colony he was actually believed to be a deity? This is a wild ride, but the Prince Philip movement, a sect followed by the Yehonanan tribe on southern island of Tana and Vanunatu, believed him to be the pale sun of an ancient mountain spirit. The origins of Philip's divine status and why he's assumed to be the spirit's son is unclear. It's believed this mountain spirit's son though would travel to a distant land marrying a powerful lady and in time return, which solidified to the people of Tana the belief that Philip was the embodiment of the spirit when he and the queen visit Vananatu in 1974 when he was still unaware of his status as a deity there. The love of Philip was so strong that the British resident commissioner in Vanatu requested the special photographs on behalf of the people, which Philip actually granted. In return, they sent him a pig slaughter club that he posed with at Buckingham Palace for them. He also met privately with a group of five Tana community members that were flown to Britain for a reality show meet and greet. The photographs of Prince Philip remained with the chief Jack Nevea, who died in 2009 having never saw his dream of the Duke's return to Tana realized. For decades, two villages on the Vananatan island of Tana have revered the Duke of Edinburgh as a godlike spiritual figure. At his passing, the peoples mourned deeply and BBC reported that a private message to the Queen Elizabeth had even been given to journalists at scene who conveyed it to the British officials before her passing. This one is kind of wacky in a fun way. Number 7 is Railism. Rail has had a colourful life. Race car driver, cabaret singer and alien communicator. He called the aliens the Elohim and the pitch of his cult is that the Elohim are historically mistaken for gods by ancient civilizations and are the explanations for many of the great wonders of the world and historic advancements. He says Elohim had hybrid children with humans that were prophets to humanity for news about their origins. Examples of these prophets were said to be Buddha, Gandhi, Muhammad, Jesus and of course Rail himself. They also believed Earth is in the age of apocalypse and we need to harness new scientific and technological development for peaceful purposes and that when this has been achieved the Elohim will return to Earth and share their technology with humanity to establish a utopia. As a result on their compound in France and then Quebec, Raelians have sought to build an embassy for the Elohim that incorporates a landing pad for their spaceships as well as gardens and temples. Rail's other interests included rampant banging, so of course he had a harem with the fun title Order of Angels. He was also super into the idea of cloning and created CloneAid, an organization that engaged in the research of human cloning, but their 2002 claim of a successful clone is highly scrutinized, as no scientific proof was found and it was also brought to the public attention, most of the staff had no education in science. Regardless, the international realism movement claims tens of thousands of members, the majority in the francophone areas of Western Europe and North America and parts of East Asia. They often attract younger members due to their endorsement of LGBTA and women's rights, as well as aid in climate and nuclear protests. Also, the aliens apparently promised us alien pleasure bots, so I think some people just want to see if that's for real. My feet phobic people, it's time to tune out. Number six is the foot reading cult. Let's unpack this whole disaster. To start, leader Hogan Fukunaga claims to be the reincarnation of both Jesus and Buddha and can diagnose followers' problems by simply examining their feet and that they would die if they were not examined appropriately. But in reality, he is a money grubbing millionaire who took advantage of the sick and fearful. New members were initiated by being forced to stay up for days and like run around the streets yelling cheesy self help book lines like, I am living a happy and healthy life. After they'd have the joyous opportunity of being shoved into private rooms where they're intimidated by thugs into giving the cult more money. Hogan charged a whopping $900 per foot reading sessions, and people who are conducting said foot readings are not qualified medical professionals in any way and have no idea what they're talking about. They take advantage of desperate people who come in for sessions looking for answers and end up leaving paying obscene amounts of money on sessions, ornaments, scrolls, books. There are numerous accounts of 
the people who failed to attend all of Fukunaga's sessions and are guilt tripped, told that they would die or their illnesses were their own fault. In 1987, the group gained official recognition as a religious corporation and the businessman started raking in over 30,000 monthly from his scams. Naturally, the authorities are on his tail for tax evasion and three lawsuits of fraud, which in a one year window after turned into a thousand lawsuits of fraud, totaling in 5.4 billion yen owed. Cut Cult is number 10, and they quite literally cut themselves out of a different cult, Summit Lighthouse, their origins. In 1975, founder Elizabeth Glare Prophet pitched herself and her husband as messengers of ascended masters who were believed to be spiritually awakened ancient beings. Because of branching off of one cult wasn't apparently enough, this couple tossed in some other cult elements from Christian science, the I Am movement, and general doomsday cult. Mix that together and shake, and you've got a married couple siphoning money out of growing congregation members to buy land in Montana, which was to be their apocalyptic safe haven. Members worked themselves to the bone and drove themselves into debt, clamoring to reserve a spot in the safe haven and build their fallout shelters. This cult held their flock from leaving by stranding them in this haven, now bankrupt and with nowhere else to go. They used tactics like sleep deprivation and manipulation against any who tried to depart. The prophet retired, not died, just retired one day in 1999 and passed in 2009. Since, the church is still run but with endless legal issues and succession debates. Builders of Aditam is number 9 and it's a super chill group if you can get behind mystic rituals, magic, prophecies and clairvoyancy. Paul Foster Case, a Catholic Freemason, founded this group in 1922. He combed the teachings of Estoric with tarot cards, Masonic imagery and the Kabbalah. Quite a power combo. Anyways, Case saw himself as not divinity but a man sent to quote, accept the enormous responsibility of founding an order dedicated to the welfare of all of mankind. And that's kind of what he's done. This group has had a following of 5,000 members worldwide, excluding those followers who don't pay the membership dues. Like Jesus, who many believed was trained in the Kabbalah, members of BOTA aspire to build the inner temple, to construct the holy of holies within. People of all faiths are welcome to study the teachings of this order. There has been some rumors that BOTA won't allow any LGBTA members to advance in their spiritual journey past a certain level as they are considered unbalanced, but with exception to that, this cult is pretty tame. No money laundering, no frauds, no harming of its followers. It's devoted to the study of mystic rituals, magic, religion, tarot, and ancient spirituality. It wants to sell you a lot of books and lessons, but that's about as dark as it gets. They even have known physicists, authors, and astrologers as part of their group. After the passing of Paul Foster Case, Ann Davis took over the leadership, but she's not as favored as the past Paul. Overall, they're said to have a slow and comfortable process and explanation of their information and practices. You can check out their website as well. Cults go Hollywood with number 8 in the countdown, the Aetherius Society. Known for its residency on Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles, this bizarre group starts in the 1950s with leader Dr. George King, who one day says to have received a cosmic transmission from the interplanetary parliament that explained that Aetherius, an alien from Venus, was our next messiah. King also believed himself to have spoken with many entities he saw as godlike cosmic beings or masters. Jesus is also one of those and also from Venus BTW and the Lord Buddha is another. Naturally, like many cults, Aetherius has predicted the apocalypse. However, the Aetherians of the past and present aren't doom mongers like many other apocalyptic cults. While they know it's coming, they weren't told when. The Aetherians are also quite existential, practicing self awareness and meditation and are acutely aware of global climate issues and politics that affect the currents of our society and our planet. At the center of the Aetherius society is a belief that around the world there are 19 holy mountains, each individually imbued with cosmic significance by George King. Mount Baldy in California is the object of their frequent pilgrimages. With energy they create from their prayer, stored in a crystalline battery and transmitted via radio signal, they endeavor to maintain global peace. You can check out this tranquil but bizarre cult on their website or their Facebook page. Classic rom-com or just comedic? Number 7 is Full Circle Cult. Why the glib comment? Well, this cult is founded and run by Andrew Keegan, best known for his role as Joey in 10 Things I Hate About You. So how did he go from acting to culting? In 2014, Keegan started his new spiritual movement aimed at spiritual millennials in hip and upbeat Venice, California. And Keegan's cult advertised itself as advanced spiritualism, or the highest spiritualism founded on universal knowledge. They also enjoy ayahuasca. This cult offers workshops and community meet and greets that allow for public interaction. Every week a diverse group of congregants will take part in yoga, cultural gatherings, and ceremonies inside the 110 year old temple at 305 Rose Avenue, one of the oldest buildings in Venice, California. It's also been used as a temple for multiple religions before this cult, which was probably part of the renter's appeal for Keegan. A year into running, Keegan faced fines for the 
distribution and sales of alcohol without a license when undercover ABC agents confiscated several containers of kombucha that were apparently brewed a little too strongly. This group has also been known to enjoy a little bit of the Mary Jane on the side too. While we don't know if there's any sinister intent in this group, we do know that it has struggled. Due to big companies like Google and Snapchat moving into the area, rent got too high for the group by 2017 and they're forced to leave their temple. Keegan promises though that the cult isn't over and rather a new level is coming, including sound, healing, education, medical type practices, food and health. This name changer of a cult is number 6, it's the Moonies. Founded by Sung Young Moon in 1940s Korea, this cult is now called the Unification Church and has had many other names. While born in North Korea, he was eventually imprisoned there under a false accusation from the government and when released, Moon fled to South Korea. Before this had occurred, Moon had already been preaching and had his first vision of Jesus appearing to him with the task to establish God's kingdom on earth. With his newfound prison freedom, Moon started his church in South Korea, a mix of Confucian and Christian beliefs mixed with divine prophecies. With that, Moon created the new Bible. Unlike many other cults, this one got big, sitting at around 10,000 members in its prime. When Moon held the infamous mass weddings, they required stadiums for the thousands of attendees. A rejecter of romantic love, weddings were the holy marriage blessing ceremony, a core ritual at which couples are removed from the lineage of sinful humanity and engrafted into God's sinless lineage. In the 70s, the Moonies made their way to the US, where they reportedly separated college students from their families through brainwashing. They've also been accused of deceptive recruiting methods, abusive practices, and manipulative financial frauds. This cult has faced lawsuits, government scrutiny, and even had 400 of its members abducted in the 70s and 80s for cult deprogramming. Moon died in 2012 and the religion broke off into three factions, each following a family member. Some follow his widow, who many consider to be a messiah and is now the founder of the Women's Federation for World Peace International. Others followed his eldest son to his family peace association, and others followed his youngest son to the sanctuary church. I guess cult leader can be genetic. In our number five spot today, we have Nexium. This cult was founded by a man named Keith Rainier, and on the surface level, they marketed this group as a multi level marketing company, but instead, it was definitely a cult and a front for disgusting crimes. Keith started off this multi level marketing career with the company Amway, and by 1990, he had started his own, which ended up getting shut down for being a pyramid scheme. In 1998, Nexium was founded and was originally called a personal development company and was supposed to help with self improvement. There was a 12 12 point mission statement which was recited during the cult classes where they purged themselves of all envy based habits. There were different modules for classes like relationship sourcing which helped the members explore ways that they could financially benefit if their partner passed away suddenly, or another class where they only learned about psychopaths and their followers. Eventually, the cult leaders started to branch out and form different organizations related to the cult and long story long, this cult was not for self improvement but was involved in some extreme terrible things. In 2018, Keith was arrested and charged, and in June of 2019, he was convicted for conspiracy and conspiracy to commit forced labor, as well as a few other really awful things, and all of these charges were related to Nexium. This story really blew up, especially due to the celebrity involvement of actor Alison Mack, who was also arrested for her involvement in the cult. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Manson family. Started by the horrible Charles Manson, this story starts off when Manson was released from prison in 1960 where he then moved to San Francisco where he gained a small following that would eventually go on to be the cult known as The Family. The group eventually moved to an abandoned ranch outside of Los Angeles and it was here that Manson continued to brainwash his followers and manipulate them with, with his own religious philosophies. He is quoted as saying, quote, I'm God to my friends, I'm the devil to my enemies, when I look to the future, I'm the prophet. When I must lay down the law for our earth, I'm the son of man. Manson claimed that there would be an upcoming race war in which white people would be killed, which was intended to instill fear in his followers. This was so that he could ignite a race war and send his followers on a killing spree, which ended up being the night of the horrible Tate and LaBianca killings. This led to a reign of terror in the Los Angeles area for several months because people just couldn't understand how or why this happened. In our number 3 spot today, we have Heaven's Gate. Started by Marshall Applewhite and his former partner Bonnie Nettles, the two founded the well-known cult Heaven's Gate. These two believed themselves to be something called walk-ins, which they said are higher beings who took control over the bodies of two middle-aged humans so as to spread their word and teach humanity. People who believed their story and were drawn in by the idea of these higher beings were of course being manipulated and taken advantage of, which is all too common in these cult stories and really is the basis for most of these kinds of stories. They gave up their lives and all worldly possessions in the belief that earth was to be recycled and the only way to continue
continue surviving would be to leave immediately. The time to leave Earth came in March of 1997 when Marshall claimed that they had a spacecraft that was traveling to the comet Hale Bob. The catch with this spacecraft, however, well, Marshall told them that they needed to stage all taking their own lives in order for the UFO to take them to another level of existence above humans. 39 members of this cult, including Marshall himself, took their lives over the course of the next few days. This was the largest event of this kind since the next point we're going to talk about, which brings me to number two, the People's Temple Full Gospel Church. Jim Jones is certainly one of the most well-known people on this list for all of the wrong reasons. He is the man who claimed that he was the reincarnation of Jesus, Buddha, and Gandhi, and he founded the cult, which was originally called Wings of Deliverance, but he later changed the name to the People's Temple Full Gospel Church. After an expose in the New West magazine about the things going on in this cult, he ended up moving the group from the United States to Guyana. From here, there were claims of horrible things and human rights violations, which led to an investigation. People found out that some of the supposed members of this cult were actually being held against their will. In the end, with all of this going on, Jim managed to convince his followers to all take their lives in one massive, horrible event, and this day has gone on to become known as the Jonestown Massacre. A total of 918 people died that day, including Jim. In our number one spot today, we have Synanon. What originally started out as a rehabilitation program founded by Charles Diedrich in 1958, things quickly changed and this began to turn into a sort of group that shared these truth-telling sessions. At first it was known as The Game before the 1970s when Sin Anon was officially born. The founder Charles, as he began to get some kind of power, he grew greedy and hungry for more. This led to him starting to charge insane fees for his members, as well as forcing the members to do extreme physical labor. This is all bad enough, but it gets worse. Anyone who tried to shut this little community down would be met with an attempted hit on their life. Charles developed a list for anyone who challenged Synanon, and this included a lawyer by the name of Paul Morantz, who actually almost died as a result of the hit that Charles had put on him. In 1991, Synanon finally met its end when it was shut down for tax fraud, destruction of evidence, and terrorism, and Charles passed away just six years later. Freedomites are number five, and they are a subcult of a cult first started in Russia as an opposition to materialistic and governed society. Called the Duke Haborors, I'm not sure if I say it right, they came to Canada in 1899 fleeing persecution in Russia. Here they became the Freedomites, who insisted on three things, communal living, nudity, and anarchy. The Freedomites are a peaceful people, periodically setting fire to their shacks and then stripping naked and hurling their clothes into the flames. They became most famous for their all-nude public demonstrations to show opposition to the materialistic tendencies of society, taxes, economy, money, etc. And in the 20s and 30s, they even stripped naked publicly to burn and detonate a whole slew of buildings to show their disdain for the government. They had been held accountable for 1,112 depredations and have caused 20 million in damage and taken 20 lives. In 1961, we saw the arrest of 120 Freedomites planning national sieges. The prisoners were of course sent to BC's Agassize fireproof prison, which prevent the Freedomites from doing their favorite thing, burning it down. A book titled Terror in the Name of God, a study of Duke of Boros, written by Vancouver newswoman Sima Holt, highlighted Freedomite contentions and factually debunked some of their misconceptions and put forth revealing content as being only one of many fanatical Russian religious sects. When some of the locked up Freedomites read it, they actually started to change their tunes a little. Younger Freedomites began working in the prisons, asking for other books and school teachers, and slowly shed their traditional emo attitude. Today, 14 have been paroled, and Canadian officials proudly announced that the first returnees to Freedomite lands applied for government land office to buy the land. For the first time, Freedomites will be land owing, tax paying citizens. True Wake Cult comes in at number four, originally a professor in Thai. Taiwan for nine years. After 37 years an atheist, he woke up one day. First religious revelation. A voice said to pursue religion. So he did. He studied every religious text he could find and then joined a UFO cult. Hated the leader, so he dipped and took about a dozen of the followers with him to start his own cult. He gained them fast and had to them open up satellite churches by 1996. What were their beliefs, you may ask? Well, he claimed that 99% of the Buddhist temples in Taiwan were led by vampiric outside spirits. The Jesus reincarnate lived in Vancouver. The universe is 4.5 trillion years old. Our solar system was created by nuclear war. We each have three souls, and that humanity has been rescued on five occasions by God descending in a flying saucer. Their whole goal was as people increase their spiritual light during the time on Earth, they would be able to escape karmatic reincarnation. This meant achieving enlightenment, the state of being that their leader Chen also called. Buddhahood. Chen pulled his followers' tails a ridiculous amount. He had them move from Taiwan to America, which only
only 150 of his few thousand followers could even do, live in cramped conditions, give him their money. The final escalation is when Chen told them on March 31st, 1998 at 1201 AM God would appear before the world on a single TV channel in the USA. When this prophecy failed, he stared into the sun for a while in front of his followers and reporters and stated that no mere man could have done it for that long. He had them shake their own hands and speak out loud and claim that that is proof of God being everywhere and in everyone so technically his prophecy didn't fail and he wasn't wrong. His followers began to dwindle and eventually disbanded due to unfulfilled prophecies and visa issues as cult member is not a valid reason to renew a tourism visa. Concerned Christians anti cult is number 3 to explain an anti cult pastor preaching about cults became a cult. Ok, known as Monty, Kim Miller founded the Concerned Christians to speak against mind control perpetrated by religious extremists as well as keep Christianity apocalyptic and severe. Monty was never raised religious, in fact his first exposure was the Christian club at the university which seemingly had him convert almost overnight. He directly enjoyed the concept that no one belonged to themselves, rather that humans were purchased at the cost of Christ's blood and thus everyone belonged to Christianity. That's not the best reason to be a convert. He was hostile to anyone he deemed sacrilegious, but usually Monty condemned easy targets like liberal churches and cults which gave him credibility as a preacher for discrediting perceived false teachings. But sometimes giving someone an audience is a bad thing, i.e. Donald Trump. His disciples failed to notice his message and personality were shifting because his charismatic delivery remained so compelling. His message was now that they were selected by God to be the only true church and that they must abide by the holy laws and spiritual regulations. He used tactics he'd learned watching cults to isolate and control his flock, cutting ties from local churches and organizations. Forced to live in group homes, they were also forced to pour all their money and resources into Monty. An absurd 100000 per family per year was expected. As his financial situation worsened, Monty took all assets from families and began the prophecy of his own death in late 1999 and that they needed to go to Jerusalem for his death, despite their aggressive anti-semitism. The group departs suddenly overnight, leaving gifts for their family behind. The families obviously alert authorities and cult members were desperately searched for. Some of these devotees were found in Israel, but the rest were never found. Leader Monty was one of those that still hasn't been located, but rumors imply he may just be hiding for tax evasion, fraud, and lawsuits in Greece. The Seekers is number 2. If you live in Oak Park, Chicago, 1954, your Christmas Eve may have been interrupted by a group of carolers not singing but rather screeching at the sky. 2,000 people amassed to watch the carolers and police arrived to investigate the commotion. They found the Seekers, led by 54 year old Dorothy Martin, who egged on her followers in the promise that a spaceship would come rescue them from Earth, while those who stayed behind were doomed to perish in a cataclysmic flood. Dorothy claimed to be able to speak with these aliens which started one day in 1953 when she was sitting home alone. She says her mind went blank, her arm went numb and then pins a needly, and she placed a pen in her numb hand and apparently wrote messages from spirits. She learned every time she kept her mind blank, she could channel first her dead dad, then aliens. She meets Michigan State physician Charles at a new age aliens group, which has a small group of like minded adults seeking access to extraterrestrial knowledge. They believe Dorothy to be a conduit and followed her quickly, just in time for her to receive a very out of pocket message from her alien guides of a coming apocalypse and a chance to evade it in the form of a UFO landing in a nearby airbase. No such UFO arrived though, and Dorothy felt like a failure until her alien buddy told her that the rising of a sunken empire would flood much of Earth and UFO round 2 was set to land later in 1954. They set out pan flips and letters trying to warn the world. Before the 24th there were two other false alarms, the seekers were grasping at straws as was Dorothy. So when they were told to go out and sing carols to call the aliens on Christmas Eve, they did. But they never came, nothing ever changed and the seekers simply went home one by one and Dorothy went to a mental institute. And in at number 1 today is the virtual reptilian cult by Sherry Schreiner. Born in a severely religious home, there's no doubt it attributed to the religion based delusions Sherry Schreiner experienced as a child and into adulthood. As even she claimed she was proclaiming God's name by the age of 2 and she was reborn by the age of 5 and by age 12 she'd read the bible cover to cover and had a fascination with the book of revelations for its strange imagery and apocalyptic predictions. She developed horrific haunting night terrors and she believed they were because Jesus was not Jesus and instead the son of Satan and Jesus that they had believed to be executed on the cross was actually Satan's son so he's wrongly worshipped. She believed her night terrors were this Satan's son who realized what she knew and sieged her sleeping brain so she couldn't tell the good Christians of the world they fought worshipped a false idol. Whew. She'd given herself a new title as King David's granddaughter as well and she believed that she had also discovered the alien agenda and that aliens are paranormal and creating the biggest deception of all time and they aren't extraterrestrial but subterranean and live amongst us in secret underground bunkers. It's the early 2000s so Sherry hits YouTube to tell the world her theory. Between that and her web domain in 2004 Sherry had an online following of 2100 people who also believe that demonic alien reptiles were sent by Satan to take over the world. After lots of money grabbing and Sherry 
Sherry becoming rich off of snake oils, this goofy nightmare ends in tragedy when a follower of Sherry takes her own life on Sherry's advisement, and another had his significant other take his. Sherry passes away not long after herself in 2018, anticlimactic from natural causes. You can still visit her active website and YouTube channel today though.